Okay. Hello, good evening, and good morning. On behalf of the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, the ITRC, welcome to today's training on microplastics, policies, and research around the globe. My name is Patty Reyes, and I'm the director of ITRC. I'll be your facilitator today from Boston, Massachusetts, and I'll be joined by Matthew Potter, the director of ALGA, who'll be coming to you from Australia. This expert panel today will bring together the speakers from the United States, Australia, and Europe to discuss the current status and regulations of microplastics and their thoughts on next steps. The tr this training is being pre-recorded and will be available starting next week for anybody that's not able to join us live. Please use the Q&A box to ask any questions, make any comments, or let us know if there are any technical problems on your end at any time. Before we begin our panel, I'm gonna take two minutes to tell you a tiny bit about ITRC. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Matt and he's gonna tell you a little bit about ALGA. Okay. Well, we don't have a way to, to flip the slides. Okay, let's try the button. Nope, everything's locked. Try again. Sorry guys. And wow, we have a big group of people. We have a big group of people here in Boston and a lot on the line. There's Matt. Thank you. I'm gonna try one more, there it is. So here I'm gonna move right on to what is ITRC, who are we? Well, we are a state-led coalition here based in Washington, D.C., working to advance the use of innovative environmental technologies and approaches. We're 29 years old, and we average about 1,500 members every year from the states, the federal agencies, uh, public stakeholders, tribes, and industry members. That's what differentiates us in the United States from our other state organizations. We have so many different types of membership. And we are funded through um, federal grants from our federal partners, as well as industry membership fees every year. What do we do? We provide free environmental resources that are consensus driven. Uh, that's our process that we reach consensus on the best practices uh, to identify the most innovative technologies and regulations uh, to move forward on the top issues that are of great interest to basically first customer is our state since we're a state organization. We pride ourselves on the training. Every document that we produce, every team concludes with training. We're almost over 200,000 people trained as of this year. So training is our big, uh, big benefit and all of our training is free. Here's a breakdown of our membership as of last month. It's an annual membership, so you have to sign up every year. But here you can see the makeup of our members and the breakdown with the industry and the states and the feds and the others. I won't go through those numbers. But this is what we're working on this year. We have 10 teams. Four of them are brand new. You can see Microplastics Outreach Toolkit is one of the brand new teams. We're doing a new team on passive sampling, reuse of solid mining waste, and a, and a very new emerging contaminant in the United States, which is 6-PPD or tire chemical of con emerging concern, their use and fate of these tire anti-degradants. We're also going to start in July two new teams, one on um, climate and the other one on the remediance of contaminant mass, remediation of contaminant mass and low permeability and heterogeneous matrices. So those are the teams that we've been working on all year. And uh, you're welcome to join us at any time. If you don't take the membership just at the beginning of the year, you can join at any time. Typically, these teams work for about two years. So here are our expert panels. Um, before I turn it over to you, Matt, let me just introduce them real quick. Appreciate the opportunity to introduce these experts from around the world. From the United States, we have Valerie Canley, with the California Department of Toxic Substances Control and the current team leader of this ITRC microplastics team. Kim Nimmer, who's also the co-team leader, and she's from the city of Raleigh, North Carolina. And Scott Coffin with the California State Water Resources Control Board in California. And also joining us from, Cali from Australia, we have Kevin Thomas, 
from the Queensland Alliance for Environmental Health Sciences, and Julia Yeager with Eurofins Environmental Testing from Australia and New Zealand. And then finally, joining us from Belgium and representing the European organization, Nicole, is Sophie Klaas from ERM. With no further ado, I'd like to introduce Matthew Potter. Matt has been the chief executive officer of the Australasian, keep calling it Austria, Australia, Australasian Land and Groundwater Association, ALGA, since June of 2022. Matt has 29 years of experience in the environmental services industry and is committed to driving engagement and collaboration across contaminated land and groundwater and is evidenced by his strong partnerships with ITRC and Nicole. Take it away, Matt. Thanks, Patty. Uh, yes, my name is Matthew Potter and I am the CEO of ALGA. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to um, acknowledge ITRC and Nicole. Um, fantastic just to have the opportunity to come together um, to put on a webinar of this kind. I'd like to commence just by sharing the acknowledgement of country. Um, I begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. With respect to New Zealand, I refer to the translation to those who connect to the mountains, the rivers and the oceans across the land. Hello and welcome to you. So you can click forward if that's okay. Yeah, so ALGA is a not-for-profit industry association representing all facets of the contaminated land and groundwater industry in Australia and New Zealand. And this is one of the things that differentiates ALGA from a couple of the other associations uh, with in Australia and New Zealand. Um, its representation includes contaminated site owners, uh, environmental consultants, remediation technology suppliers, remediation contractors, laboratories, researchers and industry regulators. Um, and I'm thrilled to have Julia and Kevin represent ALGA today. Um, Julia from Eurofins, Kevin from Queensland Uni. And again, this just demonstrates the great diversity in membership that ALGA has. So ALGA was established back in 2007 and provides a vehicle for information sharing and professional development across the industry. We have nearly 2,800 individual members and 78 corporate partners. Um, it's over, oversight by uh, nine directors, uh, three of which are based in New Zealand uh, and six in Australia. We've got 16 branches uh, spread across New Zealand and Australia um, and 10 specialist interest groups. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Thanks, Patty. As Patty moves to the next slide, I'll just say, look, the geographic spread of our branches um, is displayed on the next slide. Uh, and our branches, specialist interest groups um, and event committees uh, all up comprise of around 400 uh, volunteer members, um, all of which are committed to supporting the industry and professionals working in the contaminated land and groundwater industry. So that just, again, gives you a bit of a distribution. So thanks for that. Um, yes, so the association has 10 specialist interest groups as I flagged earlier. Um, I'm pleased to announce that since we met last November, we have added an additional specialist interest group, which is the early career professionals. Um, that group will be, uh, or specialist interest group will be launching later this month. Um, and we really look forward to um, the energy uh, and input uh, from that part of the industry. Um, the, groups, the groups meet monthly uh, and drive a range of initiatives, um, which include um, putting together this webinar, um, which has been driven by the Emerging uh, Contaminant Specialist Interest Group. Um, so if you'd like to know more, please contact the ALGA team um, and uh, we'll provide you more information in relation to each of those specialist interest groups. Thanks, Patty. As an association, we provide numerous benefits to our members. Um, and the industry as a whole. There's a range of them on your screen. I'll just touch on a couple of those. Um, advocacy, for example, um, industry advisory support. Uh, so we have recently provided a submission, um, a consolidated submission on behalf of the ALGA community in regards to the PFAS NEMP version three. 
and the Draft Natural and Built Environment Bill in New Zealand. Um, facilitated knowledge sharing, um, this event um, and other webinars that are held by ALGA are perfect examples um, of the benefit provided through this avenue. Um, opportunities for networking through our branches um, and professional development um, includes things such as the advanced ground gas training, uh, which is currently being held across Australia and New Zealand and contaminated site safety training. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sophie Class from ERM, uh, one of our speakers and the representative of Nicole. So Sophie is a consultant director for ERM and is representing the network of industrially contaminated land in Europe. Uh, many of you may better know this association as Nicole. Sophie has over 20 years of experience in consultancy, touching on contaminated site management to sustainable operations and currently focuses on program management of larger integrated services for international clients. Welcome, Sophie. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for this uh, beautiful introduction. And I'm happy to shortly or briefly introduce to you uh, Nicole. And Patty, if you can move to the next slide. Uh, so who is Nicole? Nicole is the leading European network to develop and share solutions for impaired land and related environmental concerns. So it's established in 1996 and it's an industry lab network, but it's bringing together academia, industry and service providers. It is not focusing solely on liability management, but also on added value creation of those impaired lands. Uh, yes, next slide, please, Patty. So the focus of Nicole shifted through the time. It started with a real focus on regulatory compliance and moved towards sustainable remediation. And currently, it's actually the whole land, land stewardship part that Nicole is bringing solutions on, always with a very clearly risk-based approach um, embedded in what they do. Next slide, please, Patty. So the objectives of NICOL is, first of all, engage with uh, all different stakeholders to promote integration of risk-based sustainable land management into all the evolving regulations. Uh, NICOL identifies research needs, promotes innovation and technology, explores together with the industry uh, funding mechanisms, so it's a leading European forum to exchange all knowledge, ideas, and best practices about contaminated land management. Next slide, please, Patty. Uh, some of the activities are listed, so also a number of workshops per year and uh, the current active working groups, some of them um, are listed here, a regulatory working group, PFAS working group, innovation working group, land stewardship working group. Uh, there are many publications, position papers and reports produced by uh, Nicole uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, they have an innovation and academic award and they partner with a number of other associations, uh, ITRC and Algea as uh, one of, of, of those uh, uh, associations. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm probably there. So, Patty, uh, up to you again to move us further uh, through uh, the Great. discussions. Great, thank you, Sophie. At this time, I'd like to bring up Kim Nimmer from the city of Raleigh in North Carolina, and she's going to give us a lot more information on what, what an overview of microplastics and why you should care about microplastics. Kim? Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me. Thank you, Patty. Uh, so I'm going to provide just a brief introduction to microplastics to uh, make sure we're all on the same page and to lay the foundation for the rest of our discussion during this seminar. So as I kick off, let's see, where's the advancer? Thank you. All right. So as I kick off this brief introduction to microplastics, I'd also like to make our audience in the room and uh, joining us virtually aware of ITRC's new microplastics guidance document. Uh, after launching at the end of February, the guidance document is now available on ITRC's website at the link shown at the bottom of the slide. 
And the overarching goal of our team was to produce a guidance document that provides an understanding of microplastics and the state of the applied science without having to go to the scientific literature. ITRC has also produced a two hour online training course to accompany the guidance document. And the first training was offered on March 7th, the recording of which is now available on EPA's Clue In training website. Uh, future live trainings will also be offered approximately quarterly through the end of 2024, also via EPA's Clue In training website. So the first synthetic plastic was invented in the early 1900s. Then from the 1930s through around 1945, there were a variety of innovations to plastics. And as you can see in the plot on the left, global plastic production steadily increased from the 1950s through the 1970s, when the rate of production started increasingly even more rapidly. And with this increase in plastic production, global plastic pollution also increased. In the 1970s and beyond, bio-based and biodegradable plastics were invented. However, those plastic types were not necessarily a good innovation for reducing plastic pollution. For once plastic is produced, it accumulates as plastic waste in the environment. This is data from 2010 that illustrates the state of global plastic pollution alongside the annual amount of global plastic production. In 2010, there were 270 million tons of plastic produced globally. In the same year, there were 275 million tons of plastic waste produced globally. So notice that global plastic waste was higher than the amount of global plastic produced. And this is because plastic waste had already been accumulating from previous years. Over 99 million tons of that plastic waste was found in coastal areas and over 31 million tons of plastic waste in coastal areas is mismanaged annually, resulting in approximately 8 million tons of plastic waste flowing into oceans every year. Additionally, tens to hundreds of thousands of tons of plastic waste ends up in surface waters each year. This plastic waste degrades over time in the environment, which is one source of microplastics. And I would also like to point out that in 2020, the annual global plastic production was approximately 500 million tons compared to the 270 million tons shown in this data from 2010. And as you may expect, the upward trend in plastic waste production has also been continuing. So microplastics are recognized as particles less than five millimeters in size, though there's currently no universally accepted definition of microplastics. The microplastics definition in the ITRC guidance document was developed by reviewing the existing microplastics definitions and coming up with a comprehensive definition. In our guidance document, we define microplastics as particles that are greater than one nanometer and less than five millimeters in their longest dimension and comprised of solid polymeric materials to which chemical additives or other substances may have been added. Polymers that are derived in nature that have not been chemically modified other than by hydrolysis are excluded from this definition. And as a point of clarification, monomers are the building blocks of polymers and hydrolysis is a reaction that breaks down a polymer into its monomers using water. As mentioned, uh, the ITRC definition, uh, microplastics can range from one nanometer up to five millimeters. This is a figure from chapter one of the ITRC guidance document. The largest microplastic particle size is smaller than five millimeters, which is the approximate diameter of a drinking straw. The smallest microplastic particle size is one nanometer, which is smaller than a strand of DNA. And depending on microplastic particle size, some organisms can feed on them. Factors including microplastic size, toxicity endpoints, and interaction of microplastics with tissues can vary in organisms that are exposed to microplastics. And while not the focus of our discussion here today, we wanted to at least acknowledge nanoplastics in this overview. 
And as with microplastics, there is no universally accepted definition of nanoplastics, which are a subset of microplastics at the low end of the size range. However, it is generally accepted in scientific literature that they are produced by the fragmentation of microplastics or larger particles and measure between one nanometer and 1000 nanometers in length. And given their extremely small size, as well as the limitations in instrument capability and analytical techniques, it is currently very challenging to accurately measure, quantify, and analyze nanoplastics. While the human health effects from microplastics and nanoplastics are not well known yet, there is a general understanding that smaller particle sizes are more capable of causing molecular and cellular level damage, such as inflammation and oxidative stress reactions. Also, given their small size, nanoplastics can be more easily inhaled by humans and penetrate into lung tissue. However, more research is needed to better understand the potential health effects from human exposure to both microplastics and nanoplastics. So why do we care about microplastics? Well, microplastics are ubiquitous in the environment. They are found in surface waters, drinking water, air, and even in the food humans consume. Microplastics accumulate and persist for a long time in the environment, and they can also move long distances in the environment through different media. Microplastics can also contain harmful chemical contaminants and additives that can move along with microplastics through the environment. Because of their small size, microplastics can be consumed by humans. Additionally, some organisms can confuse microplastics with food, depending on the microplastics particle size, shape, and color. Microplastics can also cause adverse health impacts to humans and other organisms that are exposed to them. In addition to size, microplastics have other physical chemical properties resulting in a large variety of microplastics. Microplastics can be made of different polymer types. They can contain different additives, such as plasticizers and flame retardants. Microplastics can come from different sources depending on the product type, which I will talk about in more detail in the next few slides. Microplastics also come in different shapes and colors. So depending on size, shape, and color, some, some organisms, as mentioned before, can confuse microplastics with food and selectively feed on them, which can then affect the toxicity endpoints in organisms that are exposed to microplastics. And finally, microplastics can also absorb different toxicants such as heavy metals and PCBs. So there are different sources of microplastics depending on product type, primary versus secondary microplastics. And this will be covered a little more in the next few slides. And this is a figure showing sources of microplastics from various product types from chapter two of the ITRC guidance document. So now focusing on primary microplastics, uh, they are intentionally manufactured for specific applications or products. Some of the examples of primary microplastics include micro beads in personal care products and pre-production pellets, also known as nurdles. Nurdles are the building block for the production of various plastic products. And then moving on to secondary microplastics, which are uh, microplastics which originate from larger plastics that have fragmented into smaller pieces over time in the environment by being exposed to environmental conditions such as ultraviolet light, wind, and water erosion. Some of the examples of secondary microplastics include wear and tear of car tires, fragmentation of consumer products such as plastic water bottles and cigarette butts, and fibers from synthetic textiles after being worn or washed over time. In addition to varying sizes and sources, microplastics can also come in different shapes such as fragments, beads, pellets, and fibers. Studies have shown that for microplastics of the same size and same polymeric material, irregular shapes such as fragments have an enhanced capacity to absorb harmful chemicals compared to regular shapes, such as beads, due to the increased surface area to volume ratio. Also, again, some organisms can confuse microplastics with food depending on the microplastics shape. Therefore, organisms may selectively feed on certain shapes of microplastics, 
which may then affect the toxicity endpoints and adverse health impacts due to the interaction of the microplastics with the organism's tissues. And as previously mentioned, microplastics can absorb harmful chemicals such as heavy metals and persistent organic pollutants such as PAHs, PCBs, PFAS, and organochlorine pesticides like DDT. So there are several factors that affect the chemical absorption capacity of microplastics. Microplastics have high hydrophobicity, therefore they will attract chemicals from water bodies onto themselves, thereby transporting those chemicals as the microplastics move in the environment. Microplastics have high surface area to volume ratio, as mentioned previously, due to their small size. Rougher microplastic shapes, such as fragments, will have higher chemical absorption capacity than regular shapes, such as beads, since rougher shapes have higher surface area to volume ratios. Weathered and aged particles also have rougher shapes than those less exposed to the elements. Therefore, they have an enhanced capacity for chemical absorption. The polymer type of microplastics is another factor that affects their chemical absorption capacity. Microplastics that are made of low density plastics or rubbery plastics such as polyethylene and polypropylene will have higher chemical absorption capacity than microplastics that are made of high density or, high, or glassy plastics such as PET or PVC. Microplastics can also act as vectors. Due to their high surface area to volume ratio, Micro microplastics allow for the formation of biofilms and biofilms are vectors for spreading bacterial pathogens in the environment. Microplastics can also be vectors for spreading antibiotic resistant bacteria. Microplastics can move long distances in the environment and they can transport chemical contaminants. Therefore, microplastics can be a source of contaminants in aquatic environments, sediments, and biota. However, vector effects of microplastics are still a discussion topic among researchers, and therefore more studies are needed to better understand the vector effects of microplastics. So to summarize, microplastics are emerging contaminants and the state of the science is rapidly evolving. As you can see from the plot, there has been an increase in the number of microplastic toxicity studies both in the environment and in humans, especially over the last few years. Microplastics contribute to the global plastic pollution problem, and because of their small size, they can be consumed by humans and other organisms. They can have adverse impacts in humans and organisms that are exposed to them. Microplastics have a variety of physical and chemical properties, which makes it difficult to understand their toxicity endpoints. So with that, this sums up the introductory portion of the workshop, and I'm very pleased to hand it over to Dr. Valerie Hanley. It's not advancing. Are you coming this way? Thanks, Kim. Hi, everybody. So thanks to Kim for that introduction on microplastics. I'm going to take um, just a few minutes to go over the status of the current regulations we have here in the U.S. around microplastics. Maybe. Okay, so I'm going to start with some data um, from our ITRC microplastics team. We conducted a state survey back in June of 2021. This was sent out through ITRC's point of contacts, the POC network, um, to determine, and we asked a number of questions of this network, including, are, is your state currently sampling for microplastics? Um, do you have any regulatory criteria? What kinds of information do you need? Things such as that. So we had responses from 25 states. Um, some critical things to point out is that we only had three states who had noted that they did, in fact, sample for microplastics and that was California, Texas, and New Jersey. We are aware that since this um, survey was sent out in June of 2021, that there are additional states that are now 
um, sampling for microplastics. And this is very common um, with any emerging contaminant that as time goes by, we quickly see additional um, folks jump on board. So uh, we expect this to increase um, every year as we go. Um, we don't have regulatory criteria in any states and only California and Pennsylvania reported that they were looking at establishing criteria. Um, and then there were uh, six additional states that say they may in the future uh, look at regulatory criteria, but they weren't actually actively looking into doing that. Okay, I don't know. Nicole? Nicole, how do I advance this slide? Okay, we're just doing that. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, so in terms of the regulatory efforts that are taking place in terms of microplastics, really what most states have done is focus on plastics in general. This is really important at source control. We know that um, as Kim discussed, secondary microplastics form with the breakdown of primary microplastics. And so having that initial source control um, is very important. So some of the common efforts are recycling mandates, the phasing out of single use plastic bags, um, restaurant utensils. I know in California, if you go to fast food, you need to request to have uh, plastic where um, to give it before they will give it to you. They don't just automatically give you a straw. Um, it is really interesting that we do have some states here in the U.S. that have specifically banned local implementation of those kinds of um, acts. So um, those types of restrictions. So that's just really interesting to show the kind of political climate that we have working across the United States. Sorry, this should not, okay, all right. Um, so within our ITRC microplastics, we have Appendix C, um, and this is a summary of statutes and regulations. Um, this is just a screenshot down at the bottom of um, the tabs that are in that um, spreadsheet. And so we focus on state programs, federal programs, and international programs. And then again, we have a tab that focus on, focuses on those macroplastics regulations. So um, in terms of federal um, policies, there is a prohibition of rinse off cosmetics containing plastic microbeads. This was an act that was um, passed in 2015. Um, it is that rinse off cosmetics is really important because microbeads are still allowed um, in cosmetics that are put on your face and made to stay there. Um, in our state regulatory context, we um, summarize um, different state statutes or regulations and we provide links for additional information. Um, and again, these are currently very limited at the time. When we talk about what is happening with microplastics, really the key is what California has been doing. California has been the most active um, in terms of regulating um, microplastics or looking into regulating microplastics. There are two Senate bills that were passed in 2018, both of them were. Um, that have really led this work. So Senate Bill 1422 was to adopt a definition of microplastics in drinking water, adopt standard methodology for testing uh, drinking water for microplastics, and then establishing a ongoing uh, years of testing and reporting of microplastics. And we'll hear a little bit about this more further. Senate Bill 1263 was to adopt and implement a statewide microplastics strategy. Um, and so this is the, uh, that strategy was released in, uh, last year in 2022. And it's a two track approach was the first track focused on solutions. So pollution prevention, pathway interventions, um, outreach and education. And then the second track is focused on the science that we need to inform future action. So in terms of monitoring um, out, oh, somehow we got a double amount put on <laughs> this slide that a little messed up, but that's okay. Um, and so, but that's where focused on track two is focusing on the science that we need to help inform moving forward. So again, I mentioned California um, uh, developing different um, SOPs, procedures for um, analyzing microplastics. And so this is um, from the water board's website. And we know that there are two um, SOPs that have been standardized for looking at um, microplastics in drinking water. And we're gonna talk about that more during our Q&A. Scott can give some more details as he was very involved in that. 
So on the horizon, um, the state of New Jersey currently uh, has a bill that was just recently introduced that was very much modeled after the California bill. Um, and its goal is to adopt regulations concerning identification and testing of microplastics in drinking water. This has not been passed, but again, this is additional work that is being done. Additionally, New York City has taken similar steps and there's also a bill um, these are very new. I think the date on there uh, is showing March of 2023. So just earlier this month, it's still in the process of um, going through the through to be passed. But again, this is looking for testing microplastics in drinking water um, from New York City. So, and then as Patty mentioned earlier, we have a couple of ongoing ITRC efforts. So our microplastics outreach toolkit team is being developed. Um, we're currently underway in developing outreach materials. We're going to have some focus on educating the public, um, including some uh, general public and K through 12, as well as um, putting together some outreach materials uh, for the legislature so we can hopefully encourage more folks to um, submit more Senate bills in other states and we'll continue to have more regulations get put in place. And also Patty mentioned um, the anti, the tire anti degradants 6PPD team, which is also um, very important in microplastics. As we know, those rubber particles are um, one of the most frequently found microplastics that's released through stormwater. And with that, I believe I am turning it over to Sophie to talk about what's going on in Europe. Yes, thank you, Valerie. So um, if you please move me to the next slide. I will talk about the status and the regulations in Europe and the EU approach to microplastic pollutions. So first of all, there is no cur currently there is no single European law that covers microplastics in a comprehensive manner. There are neither economic incentives for businesses to take measures to reduce the presence of microplastics in the environment yet. But the first step has been taken, uh, the European Commission requested the European Chemical Agency, ECHA, to, pr to prepare a restriction dossier. And this concerns the use of intentionally added microplastics to consumer goods, but also professional use projects. So the, this restriction would have a, a big impact. It should prevent the release of 400,000 tons of microplastics uh, over a period of 20 years. Next to this restriction dossier on intentionally added microplastics, and we'll dive a little bit uh, more in detail in the, in the next slides, there are a number of parallel initiatives in Europe ongoing on secondary microplastics and the unintentional release of microplastics. Overall, we can say that microplastics are quite difficult to regulate as it's challenging to identify an ecotoxicity endpoint or predict environmental concentrations. And there are no environmental quality st standards yet for microplastics in, the, in Europe. We go to the next slide. We will look a bit more in detail into that restriction dossier on that concerns the use of intentionally added microplastics. So for the purpose of this entry, ECHA has prepared his own definition uh, of microplastics, obviously quite linked to the definition that is uh, presented by Kim earlier. It's all about synthetic and solid polymers microparticles, and it excludes everything that's naturally based. Also, for the purpose of this entry, the size of the particles is defined uh, up to five millimeter in length, but there is still discussion on, on what, what the lower limit of micro plastics for this entry uh, will be. Uh, currently, 100 nanometers is uh, the most, um, the number that uh, comes forward the most, because particles smaller than 100 nanometer are difficult to uh, detect. This, there are specific parameters for fibers, and there are some exceptions um, for microplastics as well for the purpose of this entry. Overall, important to understand that is that the EU applies a precautionary approach. Why? Health risks posed by microplastics are still difficult to quantify. So we have here a citation of uh, the dossier. So it states that for the purpose of this restriction proposal, microplastics by themselves are considered as a proxy for risk. 
Therefore, the impact of the restriction can be appreciated by the simple reduction in predicted releases that were for forecast to occur. And that's why um, this uh, restriction is acting on the source of microplastics. If we go to the next slide. Um, I'll take you briefly through the timeline of this important restriction that is coming up in Europe. Uh, again, it's concerning the intentionally added microplastics. So it started in 2017 when the European Commission asked ECHA to assess the scientific evidence for taking regulatory action at the EU level. And then there was this first draft publication and public consultation period in 2019. And it was in 2020 that the Committee for Risk Assessment, but also the Committee for Socioeconomic Analysis, adopted their opinion. And then the draft regulation was prepared. So that's only ready from 2020. And currently, uh, there are discussions ongoing with the member states uh, on that draft uh, regulation um, currently happening. And it's expected that the conclusion of the dossier, so actually the uh, approval of the dossier, will happen quite soon, end of April. In that restriction, you can find elements. Uh, uh, can you go back one slide, please? So in that restriction, there are elements on the prohibition, there are uh, discussions on derogated uses. Uh, there is mandatory labeling uh, in that restriction. And uh, there is talk about mandatory reporting. And it will be a phased implementation over, over six years. So yeah, now we are at the next slide. So what else is happening in Europe? There are numerous parallel uh, EU initiatives on general plastic pollution. And the overall umbrella is in fact the European Green Deal. And the Green Deal states no net emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050. And also the Green Deal wants to decouple economical growth of resource use. Now, a number of EU environmental strategies and action plans aim to contribute to the objectives of the European Green Deal. And some of those strategies and action plans are linked to microplastics. I've summed up a few of them, um, some of the important ones. The Circular Economy Action Plan, for example, with measures that will introduce under the new action plan that aim to make sustainable products actually the norm in Europe and ensure less waste, make circularity work not only for people, but also for the regions, the cities. We have the EU Plastics Strategy um, that aims to transform the way plastic products are designed and produced and used and recycled in uh, the EU. There is this important zero pollution action plan towards zero pollution for air, water and soil. And this plan introduces uh, would, would help us to uh, limit or, or at least reduce 30% of the microplastics released to the environment by 2030. And there are numerous uh, national initi initiatives by the different states as well. Apart from those action plans that support the European Green Deal, there are some directives affecting the microplastic production and release into the environment. Again, uh, summing up some of the important directive, marine strategy directive, eco-design directive, waste framework directive, urban wastewater treatment directive, and regulations on tire labeling. So numerous parallel EU initiatives on plastic pollution. Next slide, please. What is coming up? Um, what we see uh, for, for the secondary microplastics is a lot of focus on labeling, standardization, certification, regulatory measures for the main sources of these pl plastics that are unintentionally uh, generated, for example, via wear and tear. Some of the future initiatives are um, about tire abrasion, about synthetic textiles, plastic pellets, taking into consideration paints, cosmetics, detergents, but many of those, uh, the impact assessment studies are ongoing um, and, 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 and not uh, finished yet. So assessment studies on possible measures are ongoing at the moment. Next slide. So the public perception, there is an awareness around plastic pollution with initiatives being taken across Europe. Uh, there is Operation Clean, Sleep, uh, Clean Sweep that supports companies in the implementation of the necessary pallet loss prevention measures. 
There is a, a ban on plastic bags. There is focus on limiting single-use cutlery. There are many beach cleaning up initiatives. So this on the public perception. And the next slide, please. A bit on the status of the studies uh, as a final slide in the EU. We see a lot of focus on the marine environment studies. There are numerous comprehensive assessments of the ecotoxicity of microplastics, exposure and ingestion, trophic transfer. Uh, many of those are uh, to be found on the ECHA website, uh, dealing on ecotox effects, baseline concentrations, fate and transport, analytical techniques, risk assessments. But that said, uh, there is a lot of work to be done in terms of risk assessment to mammals, to humans uh, in, the, in, the, in the future. I think this was my last slide, so I'm happy to give now the word to uh, Kevin Thomas and uh, Julia Jäger. Hello, um, can you turn to the next slide? So I'm present well, Kevin and I are presenting on the view from Australia and New Zealand and the state of the regulation as an overview. So currently within Australia or New Zealand, there are no legal limits for microplastics. There are initiatives within EPA, um, sort of different EPAs to sample um, and analyze, but it's nothing, there's no plan to move it to a legislation within the next 10 years. So there is currently the only way of, of mitigating the microplastics load is to a slow, uh, is a slow phase out of single use plastics, which, which is individually regulated by country, state, or territory. It started really early in 2011, although already the Northern Territories banned the use of single. Um, single-use plastic bags, and since 2019, more countries, states, and territories followed. So by now, all countries, states, and territories have banned most um, plastic single-use items, um, especially those that are very difficult to um, recycle. Can you move to the next slide? Um, within Australia, we have the National Plastics Plan. So all this um, phasing out of single-use plastic has been included in that. So by 2023, at least 80% of the supermarket products to display um, the Australian Asian recycling label. So that is to make the consumer aware of what can I recycle, what can't I recycle. Also by 2025, the national packaging targets um, for the industry are that 100% of the packaging is reusable, recyclable or compostable. 70% of the plastic packaging goes to, um, a is either recycled or composted. Um, and then 50% average recycled content within every packaging. Um, so that enforces recycled pa um, plastic to be reused um, within the industry. But also problematic and unnecessary single-use plastic packaging should be phased out by 2025. And then by 2030, um, the Australian government will work with the industry and white goods sector to phase in microfiber filters for residential and commercial washing machines in order to limit the amount of fibers being exposed or being um yeah exposed being yeah led into the environment next slide so within the national plastics plan there's four topics that they touch on so first is the prevention so reducing the pollution by avoiding unnecessary plastics, making sure that we yeah, just reduce plastics to, to the minimum, um, the industry to phase out problematic plastics and to shift um, to easy recyclable plastics. The recycling point of the plastic plan, plan is that in 2020, Australia um, had released an act um, to ban waste export. So no plastic is exported, any plastic waste is exported from Australia to any other country. So that um, basically puts the honor back on Australia to increase the recycling capacity. Um, and the plastic in our daily lives means that consumers should be um, yeah, recycling correctly. Um, there is a plan to make more easily understandable recycling labels so people will be, really know where to put their plastic. Um, also a nationwide curbside recycling scheme 
in most big cities um, that has already been implemented, but it's it's the rural areas um, that Australia is still lacking um, recycling. And also here at the bottom, you could see the uh, plastic um, targets or recycling targets. So um, it was by um, material type. Um, but currently that was in 2021, only 39% were recycled. Um, the target for 2022 was 40, increased that to 42% and in 2025 to 50%. And this is then um, spread across the different polymer types. And the fourth pillar is plastics in our waterways, sorry, <laughs> in our waterways and um, ocean. So Australia is committed to um, go in line with global actions to reduce the plastics in water. And um, so, yeah, introduce the washing machine filters and also think of more about how we, how can we manage our storm water better in order to reduce the amount of plastics ending in our waterways. And the last pillar is the research and innovation and data. So Australia has committed to about 20 million um, Australian dollars into a public facing waste data visualization platform. So the Australians um, are more involved in, in seeing where the plastic goes and how, how we use plastic. Also, um, innovating recycling has been highly funded and also moving to a circular economy. Next. Next. Um, also in Australia, we've got a citizen science project, um, which is called OSMAP. Um, it is that volunteers are sampling all over Australia and they get training and then they would go to the um, to shoreline across um, sort of both coastals and freshwater and they would um, yeah map off a section and then count how many plastics they find and that data is then submitted and is plotted onto this map um, and here you could see there is not very many data points especially sort of in this area um, in the north of Australia and uh, west of Australia um, because obviously there is not a high population density. Most population po population is more in the south and, and east. Um, and you could see the hot spots around Adelaide, which is um, closer, but it's it's on the on the left, and Sydney is on the right. Um, yeah. And over to the next slide. Again. Okay, good, good day everyone. Um, I'm Kevin Thomas from the University of Queensland and one area we've been investigating here in Australia is the effect this effectiveness of communicating with the science around um, the research we've been doing and microplastics in general to the Australian public. And it's really important if we're going to solve some of these problems that we need good um, communication with the general public and we, when I say we, it's um, one of our PhD students, Stephen Burrows and a whole host of Colleagues have done a survey of over 1,100 Australians nationwide to examine their perspectives on microplastics. And what you see in this little pie chart here is that less than 25% of respondents actually knew what microplastics were. And there were clear misconceptions around um, the definition of even what microplastics were in this um, survey. Also, there was some uncertainty around what um, biodegradability meant and a misconception that using biodegradable plastic was equally as effective towards mitigating microplastic pollution as reducing plastic use. Um, and what was interesting was that the perceived action from industry and government really positively correlated with how likely the um, respondents to the survey thought the issue would be addressed. So they thought that um, they would just leave it to government and industry and the whole problem will be sorted out. And this data really does highlight improvements that we need to make in them effectively communicating not only the science around microplastics, but um, some of the, the solutions as well to uh, the general public. Next slide, please. So one thing we've um, been doing to try and kind of improve this communication is, you know, investigating the effectiveness of um, labeling and helping folks clearly kind of understand uh, plastics labeling. And what we see is that plastic, poor plastic labeling is really clear and evident from some of the uh, poor waste management metrics that you see here in Australia and in many other countries as well. 
So we need to change plastic labeling to contribute to a more holistic kind of intervention on global plastic mismanagement. And based on discussions we've had here with collaborators globally, we suggest really three main um, recommendations that and we have an example of kind of a label, what it, what it could lo look like. And that would be an accurate and clear sustainability scale to empower consumers to actually make informed decisions based on environmental and human health implications. We suggest also directions for appropriate disposable um, in wherever the, the product was produced, uh, produced and purchased. And a comprehensive list of composition, just not only of the plastic, but actually the additives um, that are included. And this we think is, you know, changes like this really will help kind of move forward a little bit in, in how we recycle some of the plastics that we have. Next slide, please. So one of the things we've done specifically for this training seminar was to kind of bibliometrically analyze some of the scientific research being done down here in Australia to, to see where the, the focus lies. And so this is a skimming of a of keywords from 156 articles published over the last three years on microplastic pollution um, by Australian researchers. And whilst the keywords aren't really that informative in providing an insight, what it does show is that much of the focus, um, as we've heard to some extent from other parts of the world, is on the marine environment, with fewer studies on other areas such as soils and air. And what was apparent, but isn't shown on this um, bibliometric analysis, is that how much of the work is being done in in silos and there's a real need for us researchers not only here in Australia but globally to come together to, to work interdisciplinary um, on, on this challenge. Next slide please. And I, I thought I'd finish up with an example of some of the work we've been doing for, for government um, here in Queensland. So what you see is some an example of work being done for the Queensland Department of Environmental and Science and they were interested in levels of tire roadway particles and other common plastics and tire additives um, in urban sites across um, the state. And what you see in the figures on the right hand side there are concentrations of various plastics. They're on two different scales because the polyethylene load in some of these, um, these uh, creeks and rivers um, was much higher than the other plastics. The techniques that we used were pyrolysis gas chromatography mass spectrometry. So these are concentrations by mass over volume for selected plastics and the additives were measured by liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. And what we've seen, which is echoed in many other studies, is that concentrations were elevated at sites sampled during storm events. Anyone who has ever kind of lived or been in Queensland for any time knows that we get a lot of storms at certain times of year and you get this transient movement of plastic particles from um, roads and, and paved areas into our river systems and then into the ocean. We see 6 ppd quinone, um, this transformation product of a tire additive, uh, concentrations of that below what we see for the LC50, the lethal concentration to affect or kill 50% of the population based on coral salmon studies from, from the west coast of America. So we're not seeing these high concentrations that are lethal to coarse salmon, not that we have coarse salmon here in Australia. As I mentioned, polyethylene was the dominant plastic, but we also see um, a high level of tire wear, so styrene, butadiene, rubber, um, as well in these creeks. And what was interesting is that there was a traffic related profile, um, which was clearly defined. And we think that this can help us um, in future surveillance studies, assess kind of where this plastic's coming from and possibly touch on some of the, the sources in addition to the, to the tire wear. And that's it from, uh, from me in Australia. And next slide, please. Hey, it's working. This microphone working? Yes, get it on. Yep, thanks. Thank you, Kevin and Julia. Uh, so at this time, we'd like to turn to some questions for our panelists. We have quite a few coming in on the chat, on the Q&A, and we also have questions uh, from our training class last week uh, that we did online, or two weeks ago now, that we did online. So I'm going to start with the first few questions, and then uh, Matt, if you can take any from the chat, that would be great. My first question is really back to you, Kevin. Um, what areas of microplastics are garnering the, um, the most attention in Australia? Well, I think we've touched upon quite a few of them already in this webinar. Um, 
I would pull out maybe three areas that, that we're seeing at the moment. One is human health impacts. Um, as we've heard, the microplastics have been found in food, water, and air, and their impact on human health is not really fully understood. Um, there's huge concern that microplastics can accumulate in the body and then cause adverse health effects. Um, I'm not sure if the audience is aware that a couple of days ago, there was um, a report from the Mindroom Monaco Commission on plastics and human health that I can put into the chat the, um, the link to that, but it covered in depth um, the extent of, of the harm that plastics potentially can cause um, human health. And then we have the challenges around measuring um, not just plastics, you know, down to the, the micro scale, but the nano scale as well. And we, we heard that sub 100 is really a, a holy grail, but I would say the nanoplastic field in, in general, the analytical challenges are really substantial. On top of that, we're looking at sources and fates of microplastics. Um, we know some of the major sources, but what happens to those plastics as they move through the environment and um, how they cycle through the environment? You know, they change in shape, size, physio physiochemical properties. And I think it's really key that we understand those movements in order to be able to mitigate some of the challenges that we face. Um, down here, there's a lot of focus on tire wear and associated additives, as I touched upon. And, and really, this is all key to mitigating environmental impacts. And I think really a growing area that I'll, I'll finish up on is um, new methods to look at uh, detecting and remediating, removing plastics from the environment. I think there's, there's a huge need and a huge movement towards innovative systems that can, have, can remove um, plastics. But also at the same time, there's um, a lot of work going into developing new generations of biodegradable plastics that truly are uh, biodegradable and, and don't end up polluting the environment. And, and overall, I, th I think we've been calling on this for quite a long time, but really there is a growing need for interdisciplinary research to, to challenge this kind of complex issue. Um, and I, I really, I think it, it's you know, an ongoing um, area that will garner attention for years to come. Great, thanks, Kevin. Sophie, for you, how, what's happening in Europe that's gaining the most attention? Yeah, uh, I couldn't agree more with with, with Kevin. So um, a, apart from the tire and roadwear particles, the six PPD canon, we see also a lot of attention on on, on the nanoplastics. Uh, they but these pose challenges, as mentioned already, on the detection methods and 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 all the associated complexity with that. So yeah, tire and roadwear particles and nanoplastics. Uh, nanoplastics, I would I would say. Um, I'm, I'm currently involved in a, a, a monitoring program on tire and roadwear particles. It's a global program, but it actually gets a lot of attention in Europe as well. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Sophie. Our second question is related to toxicology. Valerie, this is for you. Why is it so important to have toxicologists involved in microplastics? Um, can you guys all hear me? Is the mic on? Okay. Um, yeah, so we've heard about how Europe is taking this precautionary approach, and that's great because they're not requiring the risk data out there, but um, you know, they're not requiring um, the toxicity criteria to be developed. And, and that's what we need to be able to have regulations here in the US, because while we know exposure is definitely happen happening, we know microplastics are ubiquitous in the environment. We know that fish are ingesting them. We know that humans are ingesting them. We've found them in human blood, in the lung. Um, so we're being exposed, but exposure doesn't necessarily equal toxicity. It doesn't equal an adverse effect. And so we need toxicologists to be able to do this research to determine what those critical effects are, what the dose response is, um, so that we can actually go forward with creating regulatory data because right now, regulatory criteria, because we can't in the US without that data right now. We're not, we're not able to take the precautionary approach um, under our current guidelines here in the US. Do you have anything you wanted to add to that, Scott? Um, yeah, I'll just add that we need more than just toxicologists. Uh, we conducted a, a comprehensive review of the literature for ecotoxin human health. And what we found was that we had a lot of microplastics toxicity experts in our group. and we didn't have the expertise in that large group to actually evaluate these studies thoroughly. And we, we needed to partner with physiologists that had no experience with microplastics that knew exactly how these specific endpoints 
uh, should be done in these studies to determine if they're reliable and relevant for risk assessment. So really we need to be thinking more multidisciplinary, uh, getting the particle and nanoparticle toxicologists to be working with its physiologists and, and even thinking more uh, broadly, you know, thinking uh, across psychology and the, the sociology fields um, and working together. Great, thanks. Sophie, can you explain the uh, potential ecological and environmental risks of microplastics? I can give it a try, but probably my answer will not be very satisfying yet. So I will need my uh, fellow panel members to support me with this one. So what I can already say, and, and some of the things are a repetition of what has been said already, we know that those uh, microplastics are hazardous, hazardous to wildlife and humans. Uh, they harm aquatic organisms organisms and they ha they generate contamination of water and agricultural systems so that's what what we know we know they're everlasting materials they're challenging to remove and manage they bioaccumulate but there are several unknowns on the specific ecological and environmental risks itself a big unknown on uh, on, on on exposure for instance uh, there is a lot of conflicting information it is demonstrated that humans are exposed to microplastics of various sizes and types uh, or through inhalation, contaminated air. I'm now talking again about the nanoplastics as, as well, of, obviously, ingestion of contaminated water, food, other routes. We know, for instance, as well, that there is a lot of plastic debris in the aquatic systems. But what we don't know is, uh, for instance, uh, occurrence, concentration, of biological and chemical contaminants attached on those microplastic surfaces um, and, and, and the possible interaction of these contaminants with uh, the microplastics. The role of the microplastics as vectors, for example, uh, of, of, of um, hydrophobic organic chemicals in water bodies. So we need a lot of further investigation on the influence of microplastics on fate and transport of chemicals. Uh, an investigation needed on the co-contaminants uh, of, of microplastics. And uh, we, we shouldn't forget the physical toxicity of microplastics as well. We're talking about chemical toxicity, but physical toxicity is important as well. Eh? Clogging of gills, interference with oxygen transfer. So many risks, but also many, many unknowns um, still to, to be investigated in the near future. And I'm not sure if, if, if some of the panel members have additional thoughts, thoughts on this one. Valerie or Scott? Yeah, through our review, we found that there's two effect mechanisms in ecological biota that have high, uh, is this on? Yeah, that, that have a high confidence that are occurring. And those are food dilution and tissue translocation mediated impacts and food dilution is, is quite simple. Basically, the particles taking up space in the organism's gut and prevents them from getting nutrient from other sources. And the tissue translocated mediated effects are far more complicated and they occur in, in humans as well. And here we observe uh, endpoints such as inflammation, uh, oxidative stress, and cytotoxicity that seem to be related to the reactive species uh, reactive oxygen species formation, um, but we we don't fully understand the adverse outcome pathways that are associated with those key initiating events. Sorry, did you want to add to that? Well, I will just add that that some of the work that's been done in California is the development of the Tomex uh, database, the Toxicity Microplastics Explorer, which has both aquatic and human health sides um, and works. To, it has uh, data from a number of papers that allows people to interact with it and look at different thresholds um, based off of the literature that's out there. That's currently going through a second phase where um, they're ha updating it since it was first released in 2021. And so they're gonna update it because this is an ever expanding field. And as we saw a figure earlier that Kim showed, we have an exponential growth in the number of toxicity studies that are being released. And so um, it's really important to go and something that's just from 2021 is already um, in many ways outdated because there's been a lot of research that's been done since then. But it's a really powerful tool for us to look at the different endpoints that have been um, evaluated and shown in these various studies. Great. Let's jump to a new question. Julia or Kevin, 
Can you explain the challenges of microplastics analysis and why it has taken so long to publish one method? I'll start off, I think. Um, so yeah, historically, microplastics have been detected in the environment already in the first, um, for the first time in the 70s, as Kim. So it's been a long time that we actually know that we've got plastics in the environment, but only sort of since 2000, more research has been conducted on actually analyzing my plastics. But I can tell you from the work I've done in our lab, this is really the most complex method I have actually seen. And the problem is that we do want to analyze for microplastics and the normal samples we get would be lead and water, for instance. And we would analyze, yes, we found lead, no, we haven't found lead. And if we found lead, this is the concentration. But for microplastics, it's, it's way more complex. And we want to know, the number, so how many microplastics did we find, but also the size, because the size is really important for toxicological effects. We want to know the types so of what kind of plastic are we finding and the morphology and color in order to trace back to the original yeah, source, where did it come from? And then we also have this huge wealth of different materials, additives. If microplastics are exposed to the environment, they also degrade, so their chemical structure changes. So you're just constantly changing the target of, of materials you're looking for. But then you also have a wealth of different matrices. So matrices where microplastics can be found, as Kim said, they're everywhere. They're basically the water we drink, the food we eat, um, the air we breathe, they're literally everywhere. So it makes it really difficult um, to analyze them because they're just everywhere. And that also makes it difficult to analyze them in the lab because you need to control the background. You need to make sure that you're not contaminating your samples with plastics that are around. So it's really important to invest a lot of time into quality control and blank control in order to, to prove validity of the data. Um, but how does the analytical process start? So we always start with sampling, but currently there's only one published ASTM for sampling of water. And there's so many different um, matrices out there that could contain my plastics. So everyone that publishes the paper or does research makes do with assumptions, but they are not harmonized, they're not standardized, um, which makes it really difficult to compare data. And that's it's only about sampling. But when we move to the analysis stage, and I think um, it has been touched on before, there's this massive um, size range that we're looking at. And, to be honest, there's no instrument that could, that can analyze everything. Um, so initially, research have, researchers have been using microscopes to analyze microplastics. So with a microscope, one can easily detect the number, the morphology, and color. But it's really difficult to to detect what type of plastic are we looking at, and that is really important, important driver for toxicological studies because that's what we need in order to assess what plastics we find at what size. So there's two other methods out there. One is spectroscopy and the other one is thermal analysis. And Kevin touched on that earlier in the study. So spectroscopy works that we shine a light on, on the particle. It absorbs light and through that we generate a spectrum that can then be matched to a library. But the library is only as good as the reference material we have access to. So currently there's in the field, there's a, a massive problem of um, standardizing plastics that have been out in the environment or because there are so many different additives and colors. Um, so it makes it really difficult to, to um, get a library that, that works for all. There is great um, effort been done in the, in the field and, and there's currently lots of updates um, in libraries, but it is, it's still something that introduces a, lot of, introduces a lot of uncertainty in the field. Um, and then we've got the massive size range. So we've got an instrument called FTIR, which goes down to maybe 10 or 20 micron and can analyze with a bit of effort up to five millimeters. But anything below that, we can't analyze with the FTIR. So we've got the environment spectro spectrometer that goes below sort of maybe one micrometer to, to about 10, 20. But still for the nanoplastics, um, the lower, smaller microplastics, is very difficult to analyze them with the instrumentation we have readily available. And there are instruments out there, but they are not, we can't use, they are quite um, difficult to use and then quite laborious to, to implement. And then we've got the other 
um, method, which is thermal analysis, which Evan Thomas is using in his laboratory. So here we um, have a thermal desorption or um, pyrolysis method, um, where the plastic is, is degraded to phenomenon or smaller particles and then detected by GCMS or mass chromatography and mass spectrometer. Um, the disadvantage or the problem with this, this method is that it gives you um, the plastic as a mass concentration, which then makes it really difficult to compare it to spectroscopy method because it just gives you different different output. But it can um, very well detect the type and the size and brackets, um, but not morphology and color. So I think that's the, the intricate part of, of my classics analysis that there's no method that can do the whole definition or that can, I think every method has, has definitely its pros and cons, um, but there's no consent between all of them. Great, thanks, Julia. Kevin, unless you have something really urgent to say in the interest of time, I'm gonna to jump to the next question. All right, um, for you, Scott, are there any standard methods that that have been developed for sampling analysis and uh, what are the implications of these regulations? So Julia mentioned the ASTM method for sampling. Uh, that's currently the only fully standardized method that's available and it's only for water. Uh, so we don't have any methods for non aqueous matrices, but we are currently developing those through our working group for sediment and stormwater right now. And those should be available probably by, or by the end of this year. Uh, for analytical methods, we have a standardized method for FTIR and Raman that we provide laboratory accreditation for through the California Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program. And we'll be using those uh, in an actual regulatory uh, program starting early, uh, sorry, later this year. And really the challenge with that is like Julie mentioned, the, the quality control, but also dealing with the data and understanding that you're not going to get the full size range that you actually want. Great, thanks. I think we have time for maybe three more questions. Okay, let's jump to remediation. Valerie, can you talk about what options there are for remediation for any best practices and moving forward with remediation? Well, I'll talk about that our um, ITRC guidance document does touch on remediation and we have a great table that talks about kind of the different options that are out there for um, both water and for soil. Um, many of them are still at a bench top level. Um, in terms of drinking water, we do know that um, drinking water waste uh, treatment plants do a pretty good job at, review, at reducing microplastics significantly. Um, and so, so that's great in terms of um, reduction, but there's still just so much work to be done in terms of remediation um, and, and how it is that we can remediate. Um, you know, really that focus on best management practices comes to source control. Uh, a lot of that is reducing the microplastics from being released into the environment in the first place, whether that's from reduction in macroplastics or these um, intentionally added um, primary micro microplastics and then break down into the secondary microplastics. Um, we, we do have um, California also, uh, that statewide strategy focuses on a few different best management practices, um, one of which was is a goal to um, ban cigarette butts in California because cigarette butts contain microplastics. And so our California Department of Public Health actually had a whole ad campaign, which is the first time, you know, driving my car down the street, I actually heard an ad come on talking about microplastics and cigarette butts and how they were getting into the environment and um, how we needed to control that. And so I thought that was a really great program for outreach in terms of reaching the public and letting them know about this one way that microplastics are entering the environment and another way. I mean, we all know that cigarette butts shouldn't be disposed of. We know it's also one of the major pollutants we find on beaches when they go and do beach cleanups, you know, the cigarette butts are there and um, also a major source of microplastics. Scott, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, just that, in terms of preventing contamination in the environment, it's you get more bang for your buck the closer you are to the source. So uh, just to give an example, microfibers from clothing uh, is one of the greatest sources of microplastics in the environment. And if you were to not buy that piece of clothing, you'd be not 
it, it would not ever enter the environment, right? And so re reducing the amount that we use, but then you can also reuse clothing, uh, go to your Goodwill or whatever and, and buy the, the used clothing. When you wear that clothes, that, 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 that uh, garment, it's going to be shedding throughout the life cycle. And really 70% of the fibers are shed in the first three washing loads. So most of those fibers are going into uh, the waste stream from the washing machine. So if you can capture it before it gets to the waste stream at your washing machine, um, that's going to be better than trying to take it out of the biosolids, which is virtually impossible. That's where most of it's going to be going. And then it's going to be land applied. Once it's land applied, um, you know, it can be taken up by the wind, uh, transported long distances into the ocean. And there you could pick it up out of the ocean with these complicated devices that are being built. But again, the, 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 the cost to efficacy ratio just goes through the roof, right? So yeah, just one example of going upstream. Scary. <laughs> okay, our next question is to you, Kevin. What kind of public outreach messages are you seeing on microplastics in Australia right now? Wow, public outreach in Australia. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that one was coming my way. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, there's as I was trying to touch upon in the work we've done with um, looking at how the general public perceive microplastics. I think that there are efforts by various um, by various groups to try and improve that. And I, and I think it's it's making that message across that, you know, there are solutions. There's some great kind of questions in the chat that I've been been answering that, you know, bring upon some of the solutions aren't necessarily um, sustainable solutions. And I, and I think that's really some of the messaging we need to get across in better informing um, the general public, which are kind of the really some of the stakeholders in making some of the decisions, as Scott said, putting a filter on your on your washing machine is 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 one of the solutions we need to try and kind of promote, and, and it's really kind of get it going a really a better understanding of um, what really are effective solutions and aren't kind of greenwashing based solutions in terms of making an informed. Um, transition towards trying to be part of the solution. Great. And how about in Europe, Sophie? Well, not an easy question either. So generally speaking, people are aware of plastic pollution. I was, um, I liked uh, Kevin, your 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 uh, your pie chart with with the survey uh, where where people were asked, do you understand what microplastics are? I'm not sure if plastic pollution is always linked to microplastics, but people are aware of the fact that this is problematic. Um, uh, and we have some bans on plastic bags and, and single-use cutlery, as, as, as mentioned. What I believe is once the re restriction will kick in on this intentionally added microplastics, we see that with other restrictions, people will get more aware of, of the issue of microplastics and, 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 and there will be hopefully more labeling standardization measures uh, taken. So that will create more awareness around microplastics in Europe as well. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that answers uh, in, in, in full your question. Exactly, thank you. And how about in the United States, Scott? So we're working with a group that has been awarded a Water Research Foundation grant to develop consumer messaging strategies for communicating risks of microplastics and drinking water. Uh, and they have some really interesting forthcoming research. Uh, but beyond that, we're also working with educators across the state uh, and around the world to develop curricula and get different strategies for informing really not just the consumers, but the next generation about what they can do about the issue. Great. I think we have time for one more question, and that is, how do we move forward with microplastics, specifically comparing the data from different regions and countries is starting to all look different and look broader, and how are we going to compare different units of concentration? Let's start with Sophie in Europe. What are we going to do about all this different data? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, so um, I hope Scott will will back me up uh, here, mm -hmm. or, or or Kevin. Uh, but I I believe first of all we need to um, to have this harmonized reporting system um, that would help us and and, and uh, in in understanding in understanding micro plastic pollutions. 
so standardizing and, and, and have harmonized reporting systems would be a big step uh, forward, I guess. Um, not sure, anyone else, something to add here? Yeah, so we're building a harmonization platform right now. It's called One for All. It's an open source platform that is going to be used for getting monitoring data for the state, but we anticipate that it will evolve and eventually be used elsewhere and hopefully become a globally used harmonized system. But for right now, the best things that we can use to compare across studies are the, the size limits of quantification, the power law exponent, so effectively the, the, the distribution of the particles, and the count. If you just have those three bits of information, you can do a lot in terms of modeling and risk assessment. Um, beyond that, you could just report absolutely every bit of information that you have, and someone will maybe do something with it. <laughs> hey. Thanks. I think I'll turn it over to Matt. Do you have any uh, questions in the Q&A? You probably have two minutes, or you can wrap it up with all the exciting things that Alga is going to be doing in the next six months. I can't hear you. You're on mute. Sorry, Patty. Thank you. Uh, look, there are probably half a dozen questions still in the chat. Thanks to uh, those speakers who are able to respond to the questions um, that they could. Um, I, I think what we'll do, Patty, is probably just uh, uh, call it uh, quits now, but um, I'll just encourage those that have asked questions that haven't had a response to them um, to ask those questions directly of the speakers. Um, so, so obviously the slide pack will go out as well with the video, um, which will be released uh, you know, in about a week's time and it's got everyone's contact details uh, on it. So. Um, so look, just in closing, on, on behalf of ALGA, ITRC and Nicole, uh, I'd like to yeah, thank you all for attending today's webinar. Um, I think we had over 800 register, not sure how many we had um, turn up on the day, um, but obviously to be able to incorporate as well as part of the ITRC annual general meeting. And so thank you for those that are in the room as well. Um, I'd also like to just personally thank um, those that were involved in uh, presenting the webinar, um, you know, behind the scenes, obviously, with Patty, Devin and Clem, um, and to our wonderful speakers in Sophie, uh, Julia, Kevin, Scott, Valerie and Kim. Um, so uh, the, the team has been um, madly meeting behind the scenes um, for the last uh, three months. So there's certainly a lot that goes in um, to preparing webinars of this nature. Um, as ITRC, Nicole and ALGA continue to build on its collaborative relationship, um, I look forward uh, to uh, the, the upcoming events um, that you've got on your screen there. So for those that are in Australia and New Zealand, um, Paddy and four ITRC trainers will be in Australia um, on the between the 28th and 30th of April. Um, and that'll be for a PFAS event series um, that'll be held out of Sydney. Um, so that'll include uh, some training as well as um, a range of speakers uh, from across Australia. Um, and we'll also have uh, Paul Nathaniel representing Nicole at that event. We'll then flip it over um, to New Zealand where we've got a couple of training sessions um, on PFAS and, and again, linking back to some of the speakers uh, from last no November's event. Um, then looking ahead, um, we've got our flagship conference uh, in October, Eco Forum SUSREM conference, which will be held in Melbourne um, between the 10th and 13th of October. And I'm pleased to announce that, again, we will have ITRC and Nicole uh, representation in person at that event. Um, and we will have a training session um, on the day after the conference on microplastics, in which a number of the speakers that you've heard from today uh, will be present. There will also be a training session on emerging contaminants. Um, so really exciting things ahead um, and we look forward to receiving your feedback in relation to um, today's webinar. Um, again, we'll be looking to put on future webinars of this nature. Um, so great to hear other topics that you'd like to um, hear from us on. Um, so uh, I think that's about it. I hope you all have a lovely evening or rest of the day, depending upon where in the world you're listening or watching from. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Good night.